Thank you. Let me start by warning myself <laughs> that when I talk about Africa, I'm not blind to the fact that there are 55 African countries. And sometimes it is very easy to assume that I'm talking about a homogeneous thing. It is not. I'm alive to the reality that what I'm saying about Rwanda is not necessarily what I would be saying about Senegal. Mm. But there are certain things that I think are unique to the African nations. And I'm talking about African nations in the narrow sense. So that when we talk about democracy, and I prefer the word accountability, mm and people's involvement in governance, I'm simply warning ourselves that nobody should define for us what democracy is. If we choose as the people of Rwanda to embrace a governing system that is satisfactory and which the majority of the people think is right, that is our system. We should not be in the business of pleasing others who define for us and have a litmus test which they dip into some democratic uh, bottle and then if it turns green, then we are democratic. I think that if we are alive to that, then we are doing the right thing. And you mentioned Gachacha, which, which in my view defines how when you define yourselves and you do your own things, you achieve better results. If you compare the Arusha Tribunal and Gachacha and what they have achieved, there is no, the differences between day and light. Day and, and day and night, mm. in terms of what Gashasha achieved within the same time, you look at the expense and what it does to the society. But I'm quite certain that there were certain uh, legal Puritans from Western capitals who would have frowned upon Gashasha saying, what is this? It is because the people of Rwanda simply said, this is our system. Our people understand it is going to repair the damages that have been caused to the extent that is humanly possible. And I'm saying that in our conception of democracy, we can also choose that and pursue that. And if we are sufficiently persistent, people will then begin to recognize that we have governance systems that can work. And it is happening. If you go to Botswana, for example, they have their own system which incorporates what we describe as modern. The other problem we have is that anything African is not modern. So, so I'll use the word modern as understood in this sense. You go to Botswana, you have a house of chiefs because they have recognized that the chieftaincy system has a role to play. You go to, to Malawi or you go to Zambia, they recognize traditional rulers. You go to Nigeria, the same. You go to many parts of West Africa, they recognize that these systems, they are not perfect. Nobody is saying they are perfect, but they have a role to play. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that going forward, we should not ignore them. There are lessons to be learned from them, and I think if we embrace them, perhaps they are going to help us in achieving sustainable mm -hmm. peace. You asked about the neo-colonial project. In my view, and I stand to be corrected on this, I think the neo-colonial project is alive and well. It is alive and well in very many subtle ways. A friend of mine asked, and, and this I say to the detriment at the risk of annoying uh, my friend Michel. The Commonwealth, for example, the colonizer knew I'm losing my my, 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 my colonies, but I must create something that doesn't look harmful. And this thing is the commonwealth of my former colonies. So that even when I designate ambassadors, our ambassadors are not called ambassadors, they are high commissioners. The head of the, of the commonwealth will perpetually be the British monarch. These are very subtle ways. Not saying that there are no benefits to being a part of the commonwealth, I'm not saying so. But these are subtle ways in which you remain in control of your former colonies. If you go to France, they have the organization for former or French-speaking nations. And, and they bring you together so that if there is a problem, the first port of call, if there is a problem in Côte d'Ivoire, the first port of call is not Addis Ababa, the African Union, no. It is the former French colonies. When you are giving, they gain independence, you give them a currency, the CFA, which is regulated from Paris. These are very subtle ways. And, and, and uh, 
you know, when I look at, because we have gone to school in this system, even the education system is very deliberate. In, when I am thinking as one trained in the English way, my inclination is to think essentially like an English person. And, and, and I think that these are the things that Nkrumah was warning us against. And there are many writings to this effect. I, I want you to read, for, for, for whatever it's worth, just read Ngugi Wath Yongo's Decolonizing the Mind. Ngugi is telling us, learn the ways, because there are beautiful things to be learned from other civilization. But absorb that which is useful to you and discard that which is detrimental. What we have succeeded in doing is that we have learned, and the bad things that are not useful to us are the things that we embrace. So Nkrumah was right in that regard. And, and, and you can see it in many of our countries. You, you go to any of our countries, go to Angola. When there is investment, what we call foreign direct investment, 95% it will be from Portugal. You go to Equatorial Guinea is the same. You go to Cote d'Ivoire, it is the same. We may deny it, but it's the truth. Can I? And then the question of the boundaries. The boundaries, Nkrumah warned us, and, and I think that Nkrumah and, and those who are there were simply saying, all these things that we have created called countries are artificial. And somebody, I think, put it very well. I don't know whether it was Uganda's president, Yoweri Museveni, that, and, and he was uh, just being melodramatic, but he made the point. He said that when they created Uganda with the Kenya-Uganda border, you, if you had a wife, you slept you are on both sides on, on, in, in a place, and the following day you woke up with your wife in Uganda and your husband in Kenya. And, and, and you have communities divided in that way. And if you are to start to redraw these boundaries, then there would be conflict. So he said, let us retain them. But we have seen that in the recent past, for some reason, we have created other countries. Out of Sudan, we now have South Sudan. And you could also see the very deliberate act of the colonizer, that almost on the eve of independence, the countries were put together. In Nigeria, almost on the eve of independence, the countries were put together. In Cameroon, which is now a problem, and, and it allows me, Cameroon allows me to tell you how the neo-colonial countries still work. Only two days ago, I think there was a vote on the issue of Cameroon. Everybody acknowledges that what is happening in the southern Cameroons is something that ought to have the world attention. See who voted against it. France with the rest of the other countries. All the other permanent members and others voted in favor of the right thing. But France chose a position that is in support of the current administration for good reason. And see how Southern Cameroon is defined to tell you how the neo-colonial project works. Francophone and Anglophone. If you go to the so-called Anglophone, I suspect that 95% of the population cannot speak English, but they are defined as Anglophone. You go to the francophone, 95% of the, uh, they cannot say anything beyond we or no, but they are defined as francophone. In other words, even the manner in, you ask, see even right now, which continent is defined in, 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 in linguistic terms? It is Africa, anglophone, lusophone, francophone. And I'm submitting, therefore, that the whole idea of boundaries was let us do the best, and that is why Kwame was saying, let us unite, because when you, we unite, then we dissolve the boundaries. The boundaries simply become administrative, and they don't become things that would lead us to war. And I look forward to the day that that will be achieved, so that we have these uh, uh, porous boundaries where I don't... I fly to, to Rwanda for one, and, one hour and 30 minutes, I have a different currency. I go to Uganda 25 minutes, I have a different currency. I go to Sudan, I have another, all other currencies. And that is why 55 of us, the 1.5 billion of us, all our country currencies are, are not defined. If they are not hard, then they must be soft. All our currencies are soft currencies. <laughs> Systems and changes. You've talked about the changes that we have seen in the last few years. It is now in the public domain that the first coup d'etats that were mounted in Africa were at the behest of the erstwhile colonizers. We know, 
Ludo de Vet, he's not a Congolese, has written that Patrice Emery Lumumba was murdered at the behest of the Belgians. We know that Kwame Nkrumah was overthrown at the behest of, of, of the, the Americans and the British. We know that Silvanus Olympia was eliminated at the behest of the, of the French. We know. Because these, we know that Modibo Keita of Mali was eliminated at the behest of France. In much more recently, we know that Thomas Sankara was eliminated at the behest of the French. We know all these. And it is because if anybody emerges who is articulating a vision which is in danger of compromising the pernicious role of these erstwhile colonizers, then he has to be neutralized. These are contentious views, but they are views <laughs> that are there nevertheless. And then, of course, we know that there were proxy wars that were being fought. Everybody knew, for example, that Mobutu Sesseko was running something that was improper. But it was in the interest of certain powers, which are not African, that Mobutu remains. We know that Jean Bedel Bokassa was running something that was not proper, but it was in the interest of certain powers that he remains. And in, we are therefore saying that it took the people themselves, and this brings me to the final limb of this question, it, is, it took the people themselves to begin to liberate themselves from such method. It took Meles Zenawi in Ethiopia to overthrow the system. It took Paul Kagame and RPF to solve the problem in Rwanda. It took Yoweri Museveni to solve the problem. It took Robert Mugabe to solve the problem. It took uh, uh, Samora Machel. It took Agostino Neto. Because the people are now saying, nobody is going to solve our problems. We've got to solve our problem. The tragedy is, the leaders of the revolution ended up being the abusers of the revolution. And that is where we now find ourselves when the people are now coming up. The Arab Spring is a product, in my assessment, and I may be mistaken, of the people saying, you have betrayed us. And if you see what is happening in Khartoum, they are saying, no, this time round, we are not going to do what they did in Egypt, leaving the street too early. We want to leave the streets only when we are guaranteed that we, the civilians, will be in control because you, the men and women in uniform, have cheated us once before. And therefore, they are saying the people are the guarantors of power, that power springs from the people, not from the barrel of the gun, a la Mao. And therefore, you can see, therefore, in the recent past, even when the armed forces are taking over power in what I call velvet coup d'etats, as we saw in Mugabe's uh, in, uh, Zimbabwe, they don't want to call it a coup. It has all the ingredients of a coup, but nobody calls it a coup. Nobody calls it a coup, but you know it is a coup because you want to have the people behind you. I think that is a good thing. The African people is now beginning to assert, uh, the African peoples are now beginning to assert themselves and the leaders are now beginning to recognize that they hold their positions in trust for the people. And I think that that is a good thing. They are the guarantors of, 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 of leadership and, and going forward, that is good uh, for, for sustainable peace in terms of, uh, uh, I see you are impatient, but there is a last point I'll make. <laughs> yes. The last point I'm going to make is the thing called democracy. If you look at successive elections in Africa, turnouts are becoming lower and lower. The most recent election in South Africa, you've seen the turnout has gone down. And I look at the young people saying, why did you not vote? You say, there is nothing to vote for. In other words, something must happen. When you find young people are saying there is nothing to vote for, we must be very worried because the mandate you are getting through that process is a questionable mandate. And this is what leads me to my last point. We must have a system where the critical majority of the people are involved in the process. And this is not for me. Kenya's Ali Mazurui did a documentary in 1980s, which I commend to all of us who love Africa. Africa, the triple heritage. And the, the line that I think is one, is the piece de resistance, is this. He said, Africa produces what it does not consume and consumes what it does not produce. And I'm suggesting to us that even in matters democracy, 
We must begin to consume what we generate from within our ranks for the sake of sustainable peace. I know what I've said may not enjoy unanimity, <laughs> but I think it should uh, annoy people in a constructive way to begin thinking in some useful direction. Thank you. Can I, can, can I uh, just yeah, make yes. one point? <laughs> I'd like to urge the professor to remove the Commonwealth from his neo-colonialist architecture. <laughs> and, <laughs> and let me explain why. He is entirely right that when the Commonwealth was set up, it was to mask Britain's decline as an imperial power. And remember, it was a British prime minister who came to South Africa to talk about the winds of change uh, blowing across Africa, a very important speech by Harold Macmillan. So it was designed, and the titles, as you rightly say, are different from Ambassador, to mask that. But it isn't anymore. And uh, the next year, the big Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting will take place in Kigali. At the moment, the team that the President has set up uh, is working with the Commonwealth Secretariat in London, which is independent of the British government, to decide what will be discussed and how the conference will be run. And, and the Commonwealth has become a genuine family of nations in which Britain is not the leader. And although, as you rightly say, Prince Charles, who is the heir apparent in Britain, has been elected as head of the Commonwealth by Commonwealth leaders, it was by no means certain that he would be. And it was last year that the Commonwealth leaders got together when he was not in the room, Britain was not in the room, and decided that they would like him to be their head. So, so I would just urge you to, to, to uh, you know, Rwanda has decided that they want to join the Commonwealth for, for very good reasons, and which is it is a great club of people who share a common set of values. <laughs> Consider that. <laughs> after, after, after Kigali, I'll, I'll, I'll consider. <laughs> but, but he's absolutely right about the French. The French... Ne the, <laughs> the, 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 the Francophonie is about the French having their hands on what is happening in Africa. And indeed, some of their former colonies have representation in the French Assemblée Nationale. Mm. And uh, we've lived next door to the French for many thousands of years, so we know the French very well. And, and you, know, you know the French uh, too, but it's a very different setup in the Francophonie to the setup in the Commonwealth. Thank you very much, Honorable Mitchell. <clears throat> uh, thank you, sir. Major Gabarin, Nigerian Army student. So my question is to Professor Lumumba. So in your presentation, you made mention of uh, how Africans were able to come out of our diversity strong this, against all odds. So sir, in line with the vision of our past leaders like uh, Kwame Nkrumah about achieving a united Africa. So what do you think is the reason that is hampering the unity of Africans to achieve one united, strong, and indivisible Africa. What do you think is the reason that is hampering us? Thank you, sir. Very quickly, number one, uh, the <coughs> question of uh, the chiefs, traditional systems. It is true that traditional systems are inherently, some of them are in inherently very, uh, very dictatorial and do not allow participation. But what is important is to recognize that progressively, the African peoples are becoming very assertive. And I can say without fear of contradiction that the safety of what we define as democracy demands that the people are eternally vigilant. And if people are vigilant, then those who are in positions of authority will know that if they don't take the right, make the right moves, then the people will rise, they'll remain in the streets, and they will not leave the streets until they themselves leave. And I think that is beginning to happen in a number of African countries. As to models, these are very young countries after many African countries, after we regained our independence, we are very young. But one can begin to see and I agree with the Honorable Minister here, he says that the people of Rwanda are beginning to lay a foundation for another, for a model, which is uniquely Rwandan. And I believe that that is something that we can begin to celebrate. Ethiopia, despite her problems, is also beginning to lay a foundation 
Tanzania, one can cite. So from Africa, one is beginning to see that models are coming out. They are going to go through their trials and tribulations, but is it not through those trials and tribulations that they grow stronger? Second and lastly on the question of African unity. I believe that achieving African unity is now much more difficult than it was 50 years ago, but it's going to happen. Not in your lifetime, not in mine, perhaps in 100 years. And I can begin to see the building blocks. When people meet in Kigali and they talk about the African continent free trade area, one is beginning to recognize that when you begin to trade and Rwanda DRC becomes much more important via trade to Rwanda and Burundi and Central African Republic in 50 years time, then those boundaries are going to be dissolved and they are going to become irrelevant except for purpose of administration. And one can see the question of the free skies. One is beginning to talk about an African currency. We are beginning to talk about an African passport. This is not for the faint-hearted. It is not for those who want instant coffee solutions. It is for those who look to the future and to the next generation rather than tomorrow. A hundred years' time is my projection about African unity in the manner that we desired. Thank you.